Welcome to another message from Citizen Heights. We are located in the nation's capital, where our heart is to inspire hope, remove limitations, and help you experience God's possible for your life. Join Pastors Michael and Heather Giroux in their passion to help you live your best life. We hope you enjoy today's encouraging and uplifting message. <laughs> you guys look great this morning. I love you too, Jason. Love you guys. You guys are great. How are we doing this morning? Good? Excited to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday? Yeah, me too. I got to get to the top of the notes. All right. Well, good morning. If you don't know my face already, uh, my name is Caden. Um, I am blessed to be a part of the church for my whole life. Not that it was really my choice. Um, uh, my parents uh, have been pastoring the church for, uh, well, since, since it was planted, I guess. And it's been amazing to grow up in such an encouraging church, such a fun church. Um, but we are going to continue our series with the Are We There Yet? The summer series, The Journey of Life, Transformation, Revelation, and Mission. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, this is our fifth installment. And the title of the message is The Journey of Life, Transformation, Revelation, and Mission. Mission. Who's been liking the, the series so far? Awesome. All right, well, our text today is going to be found in Acts 9, uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. And I want to invite you to turn with me in your Bible. If you brought it, you're an OG. Respect. You get a special place in heaven for bringing a paper Bible. Um, But for the rest of us, me included most of the time, open up your phone or the Citizen Heights app. It'll have a Bible app um, in the Citizen Heights app so you can, you know, follow along, make it really easy. But while uh, you find Acts 9, I want to just take a minute and honor some special important people in my life. My parents, I don't think they're in here. Probably not. They might have snuck in. I don't know. Um, but they've really, uh, they've, they've pastored this church. They've led the congregation, this little family that we have. Um, but then at the same time, they've also raised me and three other crazy boys. So they poured a lot into me, and it's really built me up into who I am today. And I'm just really thankful for our pastors. They're amazing. And then I also just want to thank the church. You know, this is the place I grew up in, like I said. And it's been an honor to go from a child to a friend for a lot of you. And now, hopefully today, someone uh, sharing an encouraging word with you. And also, um, I remember when we were a tiny little, a tiny little church in Capitol Hill on a rented space with Gaina next to, what was it, American that, that Theater? Was that AU? Yeah. Um, and there's some OGs in here today. Shout out Nick Nickerson. I think he's in here. OG. <laughs> Are we there yet? And this is the question that we've been asking uh, for the last five weeks during the summer. Are we there yet? Do you remember your first road trip? You know, I, I remember, so that little graphic right there, like that's where I've lived for the last two years. And I road tripped out of there recently. I lived in Arizona. And, and it's really like road trips are kind of the worst in my opinion. <laughs> But traveling around and making fun memories over the summer is great, but how many of us know that it's not all nostalgia, right? There's, there's wrong turns, there's bad GPS directions, there's, you know, fights in the back seat with all your brothers over goldfish or whatever. <laughs> but are we there yet? And you see, the Bible is full of accounts of God showing up for his people on the road, God doing significant things and staying true to his promises. And this summer, we've been asking that question, are we, are, are we there yet while we journey along those roads? And this morning, I want to take just a few minutes and talk about Saul on the road to Damascus, all right? So this is Saul's conversion from Saul to Paul. A lot of people know who Paul is. I'm sure a lot of you do. But really, who is Saul? And that's what we're going to discover today. Anyone on that road with me? Anyone with me? <laughs> Awesome. All right, well, let's get right to it. Acts 9, verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. So if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. 
Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for this message. I just pray that you'd open our hearts, you'd open our ears, open our minds to listen, to receive what you have, God. And uh, I just pray for all the people in here, watching online, or in the, in, in the room as well, God, that you would, just, you would just move, God, that the words would fall in our hearts. And we, we give this time to you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we just read Acts chapter 9, the story of Saul's conversion on the road to Damascus. And I think, you know, when you read any portion of Scripture, you need to get context, right? Historical, biblical context to understand what's happening. And this passage of the book of Acts is actually, is actually really monumental, not just in biblical history, but also in, in human history, really. We're talking about Paul here. Well, Saul before he's Paul, but Paul wrote 13 of the New Testament uh, books, he established basically all the theology that we practice and that we believe today. And he's the one that said, follow me as I follow Christ. So really a main pivotal character um, in the Bible. But who is Saul? We know who Paul is, or maybe we've heard of Paul. But who's Saul? Because Saul isn't Paul, because Paul's the good guy, Saul's the bad guy. So who is he? And honestly, at this point, he's a lot of things. Saul is a part of the Sanhedrin, which is basically like the elite, the, the very, you know, powerful, educated, uh, religious officials of the, t of the time that enforce Jewish law in a very demanding, in a very excluding way most of the time. He was a born Jew, which means he could speak the language Hebrew that all the common people spoke, but he was educated in Rome and also, sp and also spoke Latin, Greek, and uh, probably a bunch of other languages. So basically, Saul is from D.C., right? Like, he's educated, <laughs> he's got clout, like, people respect him. You know, I'm not comparing anyone here to Saul, the murderer, but anyway. <laughs> but he's, he's respected, he's educated, he speaks all these languages, he has the people's respect, but he also has their fear because he's part of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin went around and basically judged people and told them what their stand, if they were in right standing with God or not. And we fi actually find out in the chapter before Acts 9 and Acts um, 8.3, I think they're going to put it on the screen, that he's the sole persecutor of the church at this time and where we're reading. So Acts 8.3 tells us, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. You know, see, like all other Pharisees, Saul is committed to the idea that tradition and the law that, was, that went before them, before Jesus, was still the way of doing things. So anything that challenged that, anything that aimed to change it, he hated. And in this day, every Christian has heard of Saul, right? They all fear him. And this story picks up um, when all the Christians in Jerusalem fear for their life, so they flee Jerusalem. You know, Jerusalem, this is the place that the Christians, that Christians fought for. This is the, the, the promised land. And it got so bad in Jerusalem that they fled. And a lot of them went to the town over called Damascus. So basically, this story picks up when Saul goes to the high priest and he asks, hey, can I get like letters of permission to go to Damascus so I can, you know, continue to persecute, continue to kill and, and imprison these Christians. And that's where this picks up. So let's go back to the intro in Acts 9-1 because I think God wants to show us something here. All right, ready? Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now, I know that might not sound significant, but did you, did you catch it? Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So Saul is doing some stupid Saul things, right? He's getting close to Damascus. Meanwhile, he's on a journey to kill and imprison more Christians. Meanwhile, Saul's on the road that goes uh, nowhere, doing the devil's work, being a, de uh, being a deceitful, destroying, dangerous, dysfunctional man. But in the meanwhile of all that, God still shows up on his path. Isn't that incredible? In the meanwhile, God shows up on the road where he's not invited. And not only is he not invited, he's actually hated. <laughs> he's not wanted. He's not, he's not welcome. But God doesn't show up there because he's welcome. He shows up there because there's a life he's been watching, a man he's been calling, and a destiny he wants to reveal. 
And it's the same, and it's the same with us. While we were in our meanwhiles, right? While we're stuck in our same downward spirals, while we were doing what we've been doing on our same, on a same path that we've been on, God's going to show up. He's going to show up. So let's go back to that passage, Acts 9, and we're going to uh, skip to verse 3. And it says, As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Isn't that cool that he acknowledges the Lord before he even knows him? I thought that was cool. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. We're going to stop there. And as I was reading this, this portion of the scripture, it really began to excite me and encourage, you, and encourage me. Because while Saul was still being Saul, God was still being God. It's so, it's so awesome. And isn't that comforting to know that in my worst moments, in the, in the meanwhiles of my worst decision, even if I'm still going to the place, I still have the same mission that, that, that I assigned to myself, he's going to show up no matter what. The Lord is still orchestrating. I'm here to tell you guys, the Lord's still orchestrating. He's still planning. He still has a purpose for you. He still, um, he still is positioning you no matter what. And I feel like there's some people in the room today that really, need to, that really need to hear this, that God is not done with you yet. No, you might have found yourself on an unexpected road. You might feel like you're on a detour. You might feel like you're driving so fast the wrong way that God's disappearing in that rear view mirror. But he's, but he's there. He's still there, and he's still going to show up. And this is the promise um, of the roads that we frequent in life, which is pretty incredible, that God is faithful when, when I'm not. And he will never leave me or forsake me. And Saul gets one visit, and that changes everything. One visit, and that's all he needs. Saul gets a vision. He experiences revelation. He gets a transformation. He's transformed by that experience. And because of that, it leads to a new God-inspired mission. And have you ever felt like that? Like something changes. Something you experience is, uh, something you experience just changes the mission that you're on so much because I had one of those moments recently, um, just kind of a funny story. I, uh, so we have a dog, a family dog. His name is Whiskey. And uh, he's a Hungarian Vizsla. He's very energetic. I think he's been out on stage before. Some of you might have seen him. Um, he's very energetic. He's very athletic, very crazy, and he's fun. But the caveat is that he needs an absurd amount of exercise <laughs> to be happy, basically. So as any good dog owner does, uh, every day I get home and I, you know, take him on a walk, number one, because I don't want him to terrorize me all night. And number two, I actually do enjoy those walks. You know, a lot of dog owners kind of complain about giving their dogs a walk, but it's nice. We go in the woods, he runs around, I get cardio in, I kind of just put a podcast in and, and just kind of get outside and away from everybody. Um, but this particular day, the podcast is going, you know, the birds are chirping, the dog's got the smile on his face, he's running around. <laughs> um... But the unthinkable happened on this, on this uh, normal journey. Our beloved family dog, who's a highly trained uh, hunting dog, also a highly expensive hunting dog, he has more education than I do, um, this dog is up on, a, he's up on the trail ahead of me, but he's around a little bit of a, a corner. And I see around the corner, he falls, like onto the trail. And that doesn't happen. Like, he doesn't fall. He, all he does is run in the woods. So, you know, I kind of get a little nervous. I speed up and I like turn the corner and the full scene <laughs> is, is in view at this point. In Washington, D.C., in the middle of Rock Creek Park, my dog is in a fight with a real life coyote. Okay, like, like coyotes live there. Like not, not here. <laughs> that, shouldn't, that shouldn't happen. Um, but, you know, I, as I guess instinctively, I run at the dog, the dog and the coyote fighting, you know, I start screaming, I'm yelling, I'm, you know, and the, the coyote sees me and he kind of starts to like back away a little bit. And so I call Whiskey over. He's super obedient. So I call him, he comes right to my side and, <laughs> and the coyote kind of starts to back up, but he doesn't like turn tail and run. He like kind of backs up over this hill and, um, and he backs up over the hill. I got Whiskey. We start walking you know, because I have my AirPods and my phone and this dumb dog and we're going to get eaten. And, and I'm like, I can't defend myself. I can't, like, how am I going to get out of this? So I start, you know, like, I'm still yelling. I'm throwing rocks at this thing, like, just trying to get it away from us. And we start walking and this thing is following us. 
like every step we take, he's like trying to like go around or like maneuver around us or something. And I'm, and very quickly that journey turned from a very literal walk in the park to a let's get out of this bloodthirsty jungle because <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna die. <laughs> And I know we just read the story. I do have to, well, before I go on, I should probably say for all the dog lovers, whiskey was fine. I uh, took him home, gave him a bath, made sure he didn't have any bites or anything like that. And, you know, thank the Lord. I guess the noise I made scared the coyote off before something could happen. Some people have called me a hero. Um, You don't have to. I'm not going to say you have to. Um, (laughs) uh, But... Isn't it crazy how fast that mission, or that, that, that journey, the mission was, let's get cardio in, let's, you know, relax, and turn into let's survive this, right? That mission changed so quick, and I know we just read um, in Acts 9, the story of Saul. He's on a road. He has a mission. He's still pursuing that mission. His mission is to kill, to imprison, to persecute all the Christians. But God, meanwhile, had a different mission, And how many of you know things can change quickly in the meanwhile of God? Amen? He has a mission in mind, and he meets you on the road of recovery, on the road of hardship, on the road of loss. You know, he's always there for us. And you see, the mission is the destination. God's got a mission for you, and he loves you too much to watch you twiddle your thumbs in the corner or take another three-year detour or, or, or waste the gifts and callings that he's given you and placed in you for the specific mission that he has for you. And on the road, um, and, and the road that you're on is bound for a divine intersection with a divine God. So how do we respond? What can we, what can we observe from this story and take and say, you know what? Saul responded like this on his journey. That's how I'm going to respond on mine. And number one, it's going to come up on the screen. Point number one is surrender. Are you guys with me? Surrender. Acts 9 verse 4. He fell to the ground. He humbled himself. He surrendered. You know, if I'm in the presence of somebody, someone standing in front of me, and I fall to the ground, you can basically count me out for that fight or that, um, that interaction. We need to surrender. We need to surrender on the journey. We need to surrender our thoughts. We need to surrender our routines. We need to surrender our feelings, our motives, our opinions. We need to surrender. Because it's not about how well I can do on my own. It's about how can God's mission be done on earth as it is in heaven. How can I surrender so much that I am merely a vessel? How, that's what it's about. And a lot of times, you know, this is really hard. We want to be successful. We want to be self, we want to be self-made. We want to be self-reliant. We want to be, you know, self-indulgent at times. We want to prove the haters wrong. You know, we want to, we want to be a success. And I'm not saying success is a bad thing because it's not. But the upside down paradoxical, paradoxical kingdom of God means the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Amen. It's where the outcasts are loved. And I love Jesus talks um, in Matthew um, about the Beatitudes. He lists um, a few Beatitudes. And the first three, I think, are going to come up on the screen behind me. The first three, blessed is the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. No, our performance is not God's invitation to call us. Our complete and total surrender is what he's attracted to. There's nothing he can do. There's nothing we can do to earn his attention. He's, we have it. There's nothing we can do to, to fight so hard and do it ourselves on the journey that we blaze for ourselves. There's nothing we can do. All we can do is surrender, and that's what he's most attracted to. Even though Saul was still on the journey, even though he still had his eyes set on where he was going, the Lord knew he would surrender everything. And sometimes all we need is that surrender. All right, you guys with me? Point number two. Here we go. We need to recognize he's faithful. So let's go back to Acts 9, verse 7. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. 
For three days he was blind. It did not eat or drink anything. Notice how the first thing Saul does after the encounter with, with the Lord isn't like, you know, he sees, the, so the Lord appears to him and he goes, he could have so easily, and we do this all the time. I do this all the time. Something happens and I go, okay, turn around. Like, this is over. <laughs> Journey's done. Uh, mission's over. We're just gonna, we're just gonna stop right now. He doesn't do that though. He, tr- he has faith in the Lord's words that he says to him. And also side note, he has friends that lead him to the promise that God spoke to him. Like, side note, we, this, isn't, this isn't in the message, but we do need people with us that are going to lead us there because we can't do it by ourselves. When we're blinded by the light, when we're, when we're in the midst of a God encounter, we need friends that are going to say, no, I'll lead you there. It doesn't matter if you can't see. It doesn't matter if you don't know. I didn't, it says, it says specifically, it says specifically in the verse, uh, where is it? Where is it? It says somewhere. I can't see it. It says somewhere. <laughs> it says somewhere. It says somewhere in that verse. Um, the men heard nothing, but they led him anyway. Your friends don't have to hear it. They don't need proof. You know, they're gonna lead you anyway, and we need people like that. Paul later writes, or well, Saul turns into Paul. Yep. Later writes in Second Timothy two thirteen. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Did you hear that? He cannot disown himself. He cannot. So Paul is writing that Jesus in and of himself is faithful. That means, that means all the times where you were faithless, he was faith more. That means all the times where you were faith empty, he is faithful. And we were, when you were faith depleted, he was faith completed. God doesn't need your faithfulness. He doesn't need your faithfulness. He just needs your surrender. All right, and I know, you know, these past few years, for a lot of people have probably, they probably felt like a bust, you know, you've you've lost ground in in your relationship with the Lord. You lost ground with some friends. You lost, you lost ground, you know? And we're just, sometimes some of us, including myself, we just start wandering in the uncertainty that was dished out. But let me remind you that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And when you lost faith, he didn't. And when you doubted yourself, God did not. Even when you were angry and frustrated with life, uh, and your plans got disrupted, and your hopes were interrupted on the journey, God is still there saying, hey, keep going. Hey, I have a mission. I have a new mission. I'm going to show up so radically that you're not going to be able to turn around. You're not going to be able to continue to Damascus on that mission. You're going to have to change the way you look at things. You know, and when we do those two things, when we surrender and when we realize he's faithful, the Lord takes control. You know, in the last two years of my life, I realized this more than, more than ever, uh, really. Uh, if some of you don't know, I recently got engaged, and yep, and that takes a lot of surrender. And no, I'm just kidding. That's not where I'm going with this. <laughs> That's not where I'm going with that. Um, but I got engaged, and what uh, what a lot of people don't know is she's actually the first girlfriend that I ever had actually the first girl I ever dated. And I know a lot of people, when I say that, you know, they're like, oh, you're a phenomenon. Like, she wasn't in your life, and then she was, so you just knew, so it was probably super easy. She came in, and she was glowing, and it was just, this is just so easy for you. And no, it definitely, it definitely wasn't. You know, there were a lot of times in, in high school and in, in college when I observed friends, you know, that were in relationships. But as I continued to observe those relationships, they, they didn't last long. You know, they, They ended quickly. They went the wrong direction. So I really just made a resolve. And I said to the Lord, I said, you know what? My whole life is surrendered to you. This particular part is difficult, but I'm going to surrender it fully to you. So you just make it happen. Like, bring me to my wife or bring my wife to me, you know? And a lot of you know my story, but um, I was radically positioned (laughs) to meet her. Uh, going to a Bible college across the country that I didn't know I was going to attend until four days before I left. And that's a pretty radical positioning, but something special happens when you surrender to the Lord and you recognize the faithfulness that he has for you. You get placed in a new mission and it shouldn't surprise you. You get placed in a new position and it shouldn't surprise you. You know, and in closing today, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to close with some of these, with, with just some of these points. Um, and I'd actually, how about everyone uh, bow your heads, close your eyes, just for these. I'm just going to ask a few questions um, that I want 
you guys to reflect, just to reflect on and think about. You know, when we're talking about surrender, we're talking about transformation, we're talking about new God mission, whose journey are you on? Are you on your own journey or are you, are you on God's? Are you allowing yourself to be divinely positioned or are you rebelling at every, at every turn? You know, when Saul, when God showed up in Saul's path, he didn't rebel, he surrendered. Do you know that it's never too late for God? If God can rescue Saul, the murderer, the persecutor, the anti-everything that Jesus was trying, Jesus and his disciples were trying to do, if he can rescue Saul, it's never too late for you. Do you understand that he's not done with you? Do you know that God loves you no matter what and he's always been there for you? When you were still on that same road, going to the same place with the same mission in mind, when you were still on that road, he always had a plan and a purpose for you. So continuing with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, I want to pray for two kinds of people today. We're going to wrap this up. First group of people, you know, you, you know you need to respond to this message. You know, you're saying, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I identify with at least one of those questions and I've been doing it on my own for a while. It just hasn't been working out. You know, I've tried things. I've, I've stayed on that path. No matter the resistance, no matter the signs, I've stayed on that path, but that can come to an end today. The surrender is here today. God's faithfulness is on you. It's all over. It's all over. And he's just, he's just asking you to surrender. So I want everyone to repeat this prayer after me. We're all going to do it nice and loud and together. Say, Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you are faithful. And your faithfulness strengthens us in times of difficulty. I pray that during the journey of life, you would help me to surrender and remind me of just how faithful you are. Awesome. Second group of people, you know, you're saying, who is this Jesus? Is he really this faithful? Maybe you've never experienced a faithfulness like that. Maybe you've never, you've never walked with that certainty that someone's going to show up. A God encounter is right here, guys. A God encounter is right here. And nothing short of a God encounter is going to do on this, on this journey. So I'm going to count to three. And I, you know, I'm going to count to three. And I want everyone still heads bowed, eyes closed. I want, if you want to make that decision, you just slip your hand up really quick. One. You know right now God is tugging at your heart. Two. The Bible says that, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in him. One, two, three. So if that's you today, just slip your hand up really quick just so I can see it. And you're just saying, you're not, you're not committing to a religion. You're not committing to, 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 a, to anything else. You're just saying, God, I surrender. I surrender on the journey. I've been doing it my own way, but I can't do it like that any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Everyone repeat after me. Jesus, I need you in my life. I believe that you died on that cross and rose again for me. So I invite you into my heart. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Be the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we give it up for all those people?